Beautiful. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to have a time of corporate prayer and thanksgiving uh, now. It's very easy in the pragmatism of our day-to-day life to forget that Christianity is a supernatural thing. We are experiencing God in ways that we do not see all the time. And it's so easy to realize, it's so easy to forget that as we go through our day-to-day life. It could be very well that what we're about to do together in the next couple of minutes will change the future. There may be those who are sick, who are made well because of our prayers. There may be those who are suffering that are comforted because of our prayers. There may be atheists who are bewildered to discover an inexplicable faith growing in their hearts because of our prayers. And that is because God gives us the privilege to participate in accomplishing his will through our prayers. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you take our weak, imperfect prayers and use them to accomplish your strong and, and perfect will. Thank you for giving us so, so, giving so many of us the gift of salvation through your son's sacrifice on the cross. And thank you that you will destroy evil at the end of time. Thank you that for those of us in Christ, our judgment has been taken by our Savior on the cross. We pray for the many significant needs in our congregation. We ask point blank that you would heal Sharon, Tom, Joe, Jim and Brooke, Artis S, Paul and Georgia. We pray that you would be glorified in their struggles, honored in their response, <clears throat> praised for your intervention. We also pray for our friends and family. We ask that you would heal Kate and give peace and comfort and courage to the McGuire family. We pray that you would heal David and fill the Lance family with hope and faith. We pray for Laura, Maria, Cindy's parents, Karen, Ed and Carrie, and Andrew. <clears throat> we don't know most of the details, but we don't need to know. Your, your intervention isn't dependent on how accurately we pray. We ask you to intervene, change the future for all of these dear people for your good. Do good to them, heal the sick, comfort the grieving, and give the gift of faith to the lost. We pray for our local communities. Let our church be part of a harvest of souls in Mount Airy, Howard, Carroll, Frederick, and Northern Montgomery counties. We pray for wisdom for the leaders of our area, both elected and those who hold sway over policies. We pray for a continuing environment for the furthering of the gospel in Mount Airy. We pray for the other gospel preaching churches in our area. Give all of us wisdom, boldness, and skill in proclaiming the good news. Help us to display the love of Christ so that our neighbors will give glory to God. We also pray for our church's role in outreach and and wisdom. Give us wisdom, clear purpose, and favor within the community. We pray specifically for the music ministry. Thank you for the way we have all experienced you through the wise and skillful work of Barb and all those who serve us in, in song and music. Give wisdom as they craft lessons and carols and other musical events for the fall. You have designed music to minister to us in ways we don't understand. We are so grateful for the music ministry and their faithfulness to serve us so well. We also prayed for continued unity in our congregation. Give us the grace to love one another, to forgive one another, to serve one another, and to pray for one another. We pray for your mercy on our country. Bring revival and repentance throughout this land. We pray for peace so that your gospel can spread unhindered. We specifically pray for the missions work that's happening in Paris during the Olympics. The darkness of France, so evident in the opening ceremonies, make your light shine more brightly. We pray for the Ensemble 2024 and the massive outreach being executed by the 70 plus ministries. We pray for the love of Christ would shine so brightly through the hard work of all of our brothers and sisters during this event that a great harvest of salvation would change the spiritual landscape of France. For missions that we support, Lord, we pray for the Rockwells and their mission work with MTW in in Peru. We pray that you would provide workers, particularly from within Peru. And we pray for protection and wisdom and perseverance for Larry, Sandy, and all those who are part of their ministry. Thank you that our feeble prayers are used by you to do great things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing the Compassion Hymn.
Jerry was slated to preach today, and Jerry does a stellar job as our visitation pastor, and he was going to preach on a lament psalm, how God's people mourn. And sadly, and ironically, as you all know, Jerry and Mark's daughter Kate was diagnosed with cancer. And as they have been faithfully taking care of Kate and her family day and night, uh, we had a conversation last week where we both agreed that he was not in a position to preach this week. And then I started calling everyone else in our presbytery and they're either all gone on vacation or covering for the guys on vacation. So you're stuck with me today. And we're not switching back to our Genesis series because laments are such a timely subject, not only for the McGuire family, but also for so many in our congregation that are going through troubles, long-lasting trials in our lives. It's not just our congregation. This is common to the human condition in a world broken by sin. In seminary, we pastors are trained to always preach to broken hearts because you'll always have an audience. And today's main point is that it's normal to hurt, but it's possible to hope in the resurrection. And we'll just keep hammering that main point over and over again. We'll read from Psalm 88 in a few moments, and, but just a bit of background beforehand. The book of Psalms was the hymn book of the Old Testament church. There are more lament psalms than any other type of psalm. Probably because in this fallen, broken world, it's full of trouble. If you don't have hardship now, just wait because just around the corner, there's some hardship coming towards you. So it's very important that we realize how to take our troubles to the Lord. It's a vital part of our Christian life. Generally, a lament psalm has four aspects, four elements to it. It's first addressed to God. You're banking on your relationship with the Lord as your covenant partner. And you can express your sorrow and grief to Him. You can praise Him even through your suffering. It's a way to process your pain. Second, a lament lists the complaints that are going on in your life. Third, you're boldly asking God to solve those, those complaints. Uh, you're asking for relief from suffering and loss. You're asking for forgiveness for failures. You're asking for justice on oppressors and oppression. And fourthly, in almost every lament psalm, no matter how low the psalmist gets, by the end of it, you get this spark of hope, hope, this glimpse of grace where the psalmist expresses hope in the Lord. He says, Lord, I know it's bad, but I know you can fix it. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I have trust that you, O sovereign Lord, will make it right. But that last part never comes in this psalm. Psalm 88 is the saddest psalm in the Psalter because it's the only one without a praise at the end. There's darkness all around. It's mentioned three times. He's saying, I'm going through the tunnel, but there's no light at the end of the tunnel. It's all darkness. And that's very important for us to realize that sometimes as Christians, we can face deep troubles that never let up in this life. Pastor James Boyce says, it's great that this psalm is in our Psalter, but it's also very good that it, there's only one of these. Good that there's in, it's in there, but good there's only one of them. Because we can have these troubles that linger and seemingly no end to them, and yet we do know there are answers hinted at in this psalm and definitely stated boldly, clearly, in the rest of the Bible. In contrast to this psalm, American Christianity, particularly the false health and wealth gospel that says you, once you're with Jesus, it's smooth sailing, you'll never go through suffering. And 
it, it doesn't prepare us for true life, for true reality. Sometimes in that vein of, of false Christianity, you get this message that if you just trusted God with everything, then it would be all right. You never have unanswered prayer. You never have unrelieved suffering. The believer just never goes there in the Christian life. And this psalm says, no, absolutely not. Suffering can happen. You can have a dark night of the soul. And Jesus told his disciples the same thing in the New Testament, in the upper room. He said, in this world, you will have troubles, tribulation, hardships, guaranteed and plentiful. Now, on, on the other hand, some people look at this psalm and they say, oh, well, it doesn't have any answers in this psalm. And so there must not be any answers to suffering. But that's not the message of the psalm because it clearly hints at some hope. And it's surrounded by other psalms and the whole Bible with those clear answers. In fact, Psalm 89, the very first verse after this one says, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. And Jesus, after he said to the disciples, you're going to have troubles in the upper room, he said, but take heart because I've overcome the world. So let's dive in. Let's read through this psalm and I'm going to put a bit of emotion in this because I believe that's how it was originally read. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master according to the Mehelath Leonoth, a maskal of Heman the Ezraite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you have remembered no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I'm shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim with sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do you, the departed rise to praise you? Selah. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your tears. I'm helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close me in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. This is the holy, inspired, and errant word of God. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, speak to us now in the quiet of our hearts and realize, help us to realize that you are with us even in this dark night of the soul. Our flesh and our hearts may fail, but you, O oh Lord, are the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. Because of what Christ has done, we will see you in the land of the living. In his name we pray. Amen. Again, the main point for today is that it is normal to hurt, but there is hope in the resurrection. Some have said that the only sign of hope in this psalm is in the first verse where Heman cries out, O oh Lord God of my salvation. He's calling upon the Lord who covenants to save his people. He says, when you cry out to me, I will come running each and every time. I am faithful, steadfast in my love. Notice how he says, God of my salvation. This is a personal prayer. 
This is the Old Testament version of saying, I'm crying out to my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Cries out to him four times in this psalm. Heman isn't just any believer. If you look through the pages of 1 Chronicles, you'll find that he is the grandson of the very famous prophet Samuel, prophet and priest Samuel. So he's from a godly family. He's gone to church all his life. You'd also read how David appointed him to be one of the main worship leaders over all of Israel. There was three of him, three of them, and he seemed to be the chief one. So he's engaged in full-time worship ministry. He's the director of the National Choir. He's the conductor of the National Symphony Orchestra. He's also the leader of the Kohathite Guild, who were poets and songwriters. They wrote a number of the Psalms in the 40s and the 80s. This is a mature believer who is leading God's people in worship every single day. All this to say, you can be from a godly family, and godly family, families experience troubles. Mature believers have trials, even when they pray. Heman is not just a public worshiper. In private, he's praying. He's using the means of grace that God has given him and all of us to use when we're going through hardships in this life. He continually cries out. Just look at verse 1 and 2. O Lord, my God of my salvation, I cry day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Then you skip down to verse 9. He says, every day I call upon you. I spread out my hands to you. Like he's reaching out for the Lord. Please, Lord, come to me. In verse 13, he says, But I cry to you, O Lord, in the morning my prayer comes before you. So this is consistent every day, morning, noon, and night, praying, crying out, stretching his hands out to the Lord. Stretching out his hands for, for relief. He's having his quiet times. He's reading his Bible. He's setting aside time to pray. He's doing everything he possibly can to seek the Lord. This teaches us that believers go through trials and significant trials in life. Again, there's this, this vein of Christianity in the U.S. And, and really around the world that has a poisonous message that says, if you just had more faith, if you just believed more, these things wouldn't happen to you. But no, the Bible will have none of that. Tim Keller says, you can pray and pray and pray like Heman. You can be doing everything right and not be walking in sin as far as you know. And still, you're going through long, deep-seated suffering. You can be going through suffering that the Lord will allow you to carry all your life. The psalm ends in the way it does. My companions have become darkness in the ESV or in the NIV, my closest companion is darkness. And just imagine those S's stretching out and the mood that it sets. Darkness. It ends on that low note to show you that you can be doing everything right and everything can be going wrong. I know that many of you live with this kind of weight upon your soul. Your spouse is going or gone. You have lost family members. Your family members are far from the Lord. Your diagnosis is dire. And you can have a host of very legitimate anxieties and worries piled one after the other on top of that. And you bear that burden daily. Like Heman, you, your prayers go up morning, noon, and night. They're always hovering on the edge of your consciousness. And as Drew mentioned in this service, your prayers can be used of God to be working mighty miracles 
in the lives of your loved ones in your life, in your outward circumstances and inwardly in your heart. But sometimes that outward relief does not come this side of heaven. It's normal for mature, praying believers to hurt and hurt in significant ways. Haman does not sugarcoat a single bit of his troubles. He says, my soul is troubled in verse 3. Verses 4 and 5, I feel like I'm dying. Like one of the dead just heaped in a, a mass pit in an unmarked grave. Verse 6, darkness surrounds me and the region's dark and deep. Verse 7, I'm overwhelmed. Verse 8, all my friends shun me. I've become a horror to them. Now, Keller, again, is helpful here because he mentions that it, you can go through significant outward trials, but if inwardly your heart is at peace, that is a great comfort. And that's what, of course, we're praying toward. But it seems to say, Heman and, and believers have internal darkness as well. There's anxiety and dread he just can't shake. Verse 8 and 9, I'm shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. Terrors, dreadful floods assault him later on. Waves close in over me. I don't know what this sounds like to you, but I think maybe it's like a panic attack. He's just, he's freaking out. Does he suffer from depression and anxiety? We don't know. All we do know is that Heman suffers from anxiety outside and in. And it's lasting. It's lifelong. He says, from youth I've been like this. So time doesn't heal all wounds in this situation. Now it would be one thing if Heman held on to all these anxieties and he thought what is falsely um, believed in our culture that there's kind of like a yin and a yang where there's like the universe and there's like a good side and a bad side and God's part of the good side and you know he he's working good for you but he just can't get over there to the bad side because there's some balance going on no Heman has a much bigger view of God's sovereignty he says your hand is upon me you're doing this to me look at the accusations in verses 6 7 and 8 you have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. This is God's doing in his life. And he's not holding back his frustration. He's fully venting his despair. He bitterly complains. It's, it's full finger pointing. He's like, it's like he's accusing God. I, I'm on the verge. I'm on the precipice. I'm one step from the grave, and you're pushing me in. That's the violence of this prayer. It's not polite. It's not something that we would expect in the Bible. Commentator Derek Kedner says, the very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding he knows how men speak when we are desperate. And, and Keller uh, goes on and he says, isn't it amazing that God didn't censor this prayer and say, no, I, I don't want this kind of prayer and this kind of person in my Bible. I, I need it squeaky clean. No, he said, these kind of people that are raw and real, they're my people. I'm their God. I'm the God of their salvation. They can call on me and say, God, God of my salvation, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. How, how comforting that is. We don't have to put on a happy face in the morning and look good in front of God. We can really share the burdens that we're going through. <laughs> and he, he knows that you know, he's a holy God and he deserves all reverence and respect. And yet he wants everything. He wants our honesty because he's the God of grace. And he, he says, in spite of you praying in the wrong way, in spite of you 
not knowing what to say or, or saying too much, you might say, I'm your God, the God of your salvation. In your best times, in your darkest times, I'm there for you. It teaches us that he understands what we're going through, the despair, the rage, the heartache, every emotion. And he doesn't mind that we share it with him. He already knows. He's the omniscient God. And that's a huge difference between a godly lament and an ungodly complaint session. And do you notice what it is? It's simply that we go to God with our distress. We talk to him and not about him in abstract ways. He wants personal interaction with us. Not, oh, God's doing this out here. No, God, you are doing this. He wants those second-person pronouns. God, it's you and me. Let's have a conversation. Let's get real. And you see that not only in this psalm, but other psalms, and in Job, and in Jeremiah, and Habakkuk, and other places in the Bible. I remember a dear friend of mine, his mother, he... We don't know where he is. We think he committed suicide, and the ocean washed him away. I, he, he was, long story, he, he was um, addicted to drugs. He had a very bad trip with mushrooms, went out onto the beach, and disappeared. And we never saw him again. We think he drowned. Uh, but that poor lady, his mom, a, a believing lady, and I asked him, how, how are you getting through this? And she said, I read through the Psalms. I read through Job. And it's like they're, they're speaking the words of my heart. They're crying out what I want to cry out to the Lord. They comfort me daily. The Lord is so patient with us as we give our griefs to him. So... It's normal to hurt. But there's hope in the resurrection. There's great hope in the resurrection. Even as this psalmist goes deep into his despair, ironically, he's giving us a glimpse of the gospel, of the resurrection. Do you remember how laments are supposed to have this spark of hope, this, this prayer like, I trust you, Lord. But Heman, in his despair, throws out these sarcastic questions. They're almost like rhetorical questions. And in his mind, he's functioning with the Old Testament gospel where the Lord worked miraculous signs and wonders and brought his people out of Egypt through the Exodus story, you know, part of the Red Sea and, and showed up on Mount Sinai and gave them the manna and the quail and provided for them as they went through the wilderness. And he's thinking those things are out there and far away from me. And those things, those miracles that happen are in the land of the living. But basically, as he goes through these questions, he's saying, will you work your miracles for the dead? When I'm dead and buried, are you going to work miracles for me? And Legan Duncan says, isn't it ironic that if we turn a few pages to the New Testament, Yes, it, it highlights what God will do for the dead through the resurrection. Heman asks, Lord, will you perform wonders for the dead? Yes, as a matter of fact, I will, the Lord says. Will departed spirits rise and praise you? Yes, Old Testament believer, they will. Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave? Yes, in my son's grave. Will your faithfulness be shown in Abaddon and the, in the abyss and the depths of hell? Yes, my son will endure hell for you. Will your wonders be made known in the darkness? Oh, yes, they will, in the deepest depths of hell. Will your righteousness be known in the land of forgetfulness? Absolutely. You see, the psalmist thinking that God's wonders and miracles occur only in the land of the living only highlights the great hope in the resurrection we do have a wonderful 
hope that our souls immediately as we die go up to be with the Lord in heaven. And when Jesus comes back to earth someday, then our bodies will be resurrected and we will fully enjoy the new life that is to come, both body and soul, for all of eternity. And this psalm highlights that. He's asking all these questions. Will you do this, Lord, for the dead? And he says, absolutely. In the meantime, when we feel like we're walking through the darkest, deepest night, we can realize that it's only a shadow of that night, that Jesus truly walked through that dark night of the soul. We think back to the upper room as Satan entered Judas and he went out to betray Jesus. And John, the gospel writer, says, and it was night, darkness. As he prayed into the night, that dark night in the garden, his closest friends fell asleep on him. As Judas came to kiss and betray him, led the soldiers to them, they all fled like rabbits. And only Peter and John followed at a distance. And when Peter was confronted, his number one disciple, his closest friend, denied him three times. And then as morning came, it only came with beatings and jeerings, people spitting in his face, unjust convictions. And as he was hammered on that cross, darkness covered the land physically. And as he hung there, he literally felt the spiritual darkness of all of our sins, the judgment of the world upon him as his father was silent. He suffered that ultimate dark night of the soul where he was truly alone in darkness so that we would not have to. After his resurrection, he sent the Holy Spirit to live in believers' hearts so that we would have the light of his presence, that he would work wonders in our dead hearts to make us alive and part of his kingdom because our God is a God of resurrection, of resurrected hope and dreams, of resurrected relationships, of resurrected bodies, of a resurrected world. Theologian and pastor John Piper wrote a book entitled Don't Waste Your Life. And he was basically challenging Christians, encouraging us to live our lives in light of eternity. And then he was diagnosed with cancer. And on the eve of his cancer surgery, he wrote an article, Don't Waste Your Cancer. And he doubled down on what he was advocating for other Christians. And in two pages, he gives 10 beautiful bullet points about how to use your suffering and your pain. I'm going to change some of the times he uses the word cancer to troubles, trials, heartaches, and so forth to make it more inclusive to where you may be. I write this on the eve of my cancer surgery. I believe in God's power to heal by miracles or by medicine. I believe it is right and good to pray for both kinds of healing. Cancer is not wasted when it is healed by God. He gets the glory, and that's why cancer exists. So not to pray for healing may waste your cancer, but healing is not God's plan for everyone. But there are many other ways to waste your cancer, and I am praying for myself and for you that we will not waste this pain. Number one, you will waste your trial if you do not believe that it is designed for you by God. It will not do to say that God only uses our trial, but doesn't design it. What God permits, he permits for a reason, and that reason is his design. Two, you will waste your hurt if you believe it is ultimately a curse and not a gift. Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. The Lord does not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. Three, you will waste your pains if you seek comfort from your odds of living rather than from God. Four, you will waste your dire diagnosis if you refuse to think about death. 
We will all die if Jesus postpones his return. Not to think about that, what it will be like to leave this life and meet God is folly. Five, you will waste your illness if you think that beating cancer means staying alive rather than cherishing Christ. Satan's designs and God's designs in your cancer are not the same. Satan designs to destroy your love for Christ. God designs to deepen your love for Christ. Cancer does not win if you die. It wins if you fail to cherish Christ. God's design is to wean you from the world and feast you on the sufficiency of Christ. Six, you will waste your problem if you spend too much time reading about your problem and not enough time reading about God. Seven, you will waste your pain if you let it drive you into solitude instead of deepening your relationship with others in manifest affection. Eight, you will waste your loss if you grieve as those who have no hope in the resurrection. Nine, you will waste your heartache if you treat sin as casually as before. Are your besetting sins as attractive as they were before you had this heartache? If so, you are wasting your heartache. Heartache is designed to destroy the appetite for sin. 10. You will waste your hurt if you fail to use it as a means to, of witness to the truth and glory of Christ. Christians are never anywhere by divine accident. There are reasons for why we wind up where we do. Remember, you are never left alone. You have the help you need. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory of Jesus Christ. All of us who believe would be wise to take that good counsel. One last story to conclude. I was on a missions trip to Ecuador, and there were hundreds of us on this trip in many different teams. My mentor was on another team and came back to share with our church where he had been and what he was doing. He went making rounds with an Ecuadorian pastor to those in his congregation who were suffering. There was an Ecuadorian lady, a young mother of four or five boys, not even 35 years old, and she had terminal cancer. She had a tumor in her abdomen that was grossly extending her abdomen. It was beyond anything a pregnancy would do, um, twice as much, and it incapacitated her. She had to lie down through most of the day. And my mentor saw her and just all the compassion in his heart went out to her as it would any of us. And he thought, what do I say to this lady? I don't know. But the Ecuadorian pastor knew. He said, my dear sister in Christ, you have been given a gift. All of us die, but not all of us know when we are to die. You have another two months, maybe, with your family where you can be investing in your boys and telling them about your hope in the resurrection and giving them an eternal perspective on everything that they go through in life. And it was a great comfort to that woman, as I hope it is for us all. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, it's so normal to hurt and even die in this world, but we have such great hope in your resurrected resurrection. Thank you for this hard psalm, this awful psalm. We thank you for its realism, how it shakes us out of our nativity. This world is full of darkness and despair. We all have experienced the dark night of the soul, and yet we have not. Because Jesus got the destruction and darkness that we deserved on the cross, so that even in our darkness, we can know 
your joy through the Holy Spirit. We ask that through his power, through the Holy Spirit, through your word, that you would allow us to live for you in dark times, to be honest with you in our darkest hour, to know your light for all eternity. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please rise as we sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Receive the Lord's benediction. May the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.